everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Young Wildlife Photographers Photo Chat. It's your hosts, Martin and Alex, and today we're going to be doing a discussion with Sadie Hine and Noah, how do you pronounce your last name? Orloff. <laughs> Orloff. I did not want to mess that up. I thought so, but I didn't want to be like Orloff or something like that. Just like <laughs> it's fine. Talk. It's fine. I understand. All right. All right. We'll run that again. All right. Orloff and Sadie Hine. That was right? Yep. Did get that wrong? That's it. Right. Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Young Wildlife Photographers Photo Chat. It's your hosts, Martin and Alex, and today we'll be doing an open discussion with Sadie Hine and Noah Orloff. You guys want to talk about yourselves a little bit, introduce yourselves? Okay, I guess I can go first. Um, I'm Sadie. I'm 17 right now and um, living in the Bay Area in California. Um, And we just moved from Colorado, so I've also spent a lot of time with um, wildlife there. Yeah, I'm Noah. Um... I'm from Minnesota. I'm in the Twin Cities area, and uh, I've been taking photos of birds and wildlife for uh, roughly four years now, but uh, really the creative aspect I've been focusing on uh, pretty much for the last year or so. Good stuff. That's awesome. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be showing people's photos, and I'll, of course, explain the photos for people who are listening on a podcast, and then they're going to tell the story behind the shot. So, yeah, I mean, that's basically what we're looking at. You know, we just want to have free-flowing discussion. It's more fun. And I know you guys, Um, I think this is going to be the day before we upload the one with Christopher and Daniel. So I think you guys, it's going to be the similar thing to that. Oh, that's a nice shot. I love that shot. <laughs> All right. So for people who are listening on a podcast, this is a, is that a burrowing owl? Yeah. On top of a steel, is that a <laughs> wheel? Yeah, I think so. So um... And some barbed wire on the background. Mm-hmm. So in Colorado, you can go and drive out um, out east where there's no mountains and it's all flat and it's a bunch of farmlands and open fields and stuff like that. And there's also a crazy amount of prairie dog colonies there. Um, I think there's some that you can actually see in satellite images. They just keep going and going for miles. Oh, really? That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can totally just spend an afternoon driving around some of the roads and stuff. Um, we pulled over by... Um, this one prairie dog colony and there was there were a lot of um, old tractors and stuff which you can see like a wheel from one of them and then the barbed wire in the background and um, it's really interesting to see how the owls will interact with the prairie dogs and stuff there too because um, the prairie dogs they have a whole community set up um, and they have a bunch of different calls for like alarms or like oh there might be something over there and then the owls will also um respond to those too if there's an alarm call they'll all run back into the burrow they're in and stuff oh, really well That's don't crazy. the don't the burrowing owls actually use the nests of the prairie, prairie dogs they do yeah and um i've seen a couple burrowing owls here in california too um there's no prairie dogs though but there's the yeah i think they're just called california ground squirrels and mm-hmm. stuff but it's really interesting and i know that there's owls in florida too but i have no idea what um animal they're sharing like burrows oh, with i'm actually i'm hoping hoping plan is possibly if covid gets a little better by april with like vaccines and everything i want to get down to florida and photograph burrowing owls i really well, want to yeah. yeah you know actually they're having some population problems i think in florida so what they're doing is they're paying people to like have them have nesting burrowing owls in their yard in like a certain community mm-hmm. and i would say yeah. you don't have to pay me to do that exactly there um well there's actually a bunch of parks and stuff like that where they have just they have the, they make man-made holes, right? And just like walking parks and dog parks. And they just don't care. Like the owls will just sit there and they have like a barrier 10 feet. You can't get any closer. And they just like, they don't care at all. You know, and I really want to get this. I mean, they're really pretty birds. The, um, what did like, what do they behave like on average? You know, do they hunt a lot? You know, are they yeah, active so, during the day a ton? Um, at first, especially with the families too, all of the youngsters will stay like kind of right around the burrow and stuff. And I guess it depends on, um, like, the specific owl in the area they're into, because some are definitely a lot more skittish than others, I think, just because they're not used to seeing people in cars yeah. as much. Um, but if they do, you know, go into the burrow and get scared, you can sit and wait, and eventually they'll come out. And um, something that I'm hoping to photograph this summer when I'm back in the area is um, there's a lot of large beetles, I'm not sure what they're called, that will be mm-hmm. running around. And then... Um, a lot of the young owls will practice hunting on them and stuff. And you see them like kind of sneaking up and then they'll go and jump on top of it. And it's, 
kind of funny think, <laughs> behavior. Yeah. You know, are, are burrowing yeah. owls more like walkers or flyers? Because I've had I've seen birds that like never fly. Yeah. So um, most of the burrowing owls. Or I guess the easiest way to see them is when they're perched on something, like in the photo with the um, the wheel, and then they'll also sit on fence posts and stuff, yeah. because there's not a lot of trees um, out there. Um, but you also do see them walking around quite a bit and stuff too. But when they do fly, it's super low to the ground, and they're not like um, hawks or something where they'll go and they'll like look from the sky and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, I ha- there was some there were some ducks that I. You know, I don't know. I don't know what I want to call them, but they used to come up to me. So they had to come up and they'd climb a whole bunch of rocks and they could just fly up them, but they struggled like climbing up these rocks up to me. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they never flew. Kind of Wait, weird. Noah, um, you ever gotten burrowing by any chance or not? No, no. This spring I was, I was planning on, um, or, or this past spring, I was planning on going uh, to Florida and uh, possibly seeing some there, but because of the pandemic that, uh, unfortunately yeah. did not happen but it's definitely a species that's um high on my list and i i really think that the opportunities with them uh from what i've heard and seen um can be truly amazing and uh sounds like they behavior too man the pandemic is just ruining everybody's plans <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a nice one i like that all right so for people who are at home this is a is that a snowy owl or it's, oh, it's a hawk some kind it's of. a peregrine falcon so oh it does well, look, I, it does kind of i mess that defense, up very <laughs> in his defense it does kind of look like a snowy a little bit when it's flying it does um and then in the background it's a cloud with some really nice color on it kind of pinkish red and the peregrine falcon is silhouetted and so is the building yeah yeah so this one uh i spent some time um in the spring unfortunately as i said i wasn't able to hang out with burrowing owls but instead in Minnesota, I took advantage of a peregrine falcon nest box near me. So uh, I saw I saw the adults there at the beginning of spring and then um, went a couple times throughout the season. And um, at one point I got there and there were some fledglings, which was awesome to see. And photographing them at first, it was a lot of opportunities that were kind of rough because um, it's a nest box on a pretty tall building. So the perspective isn't that great. Um, the photos aren't turning out that great because lots of distracting elements, lots of um, kind of, kind of, you know, buildings in the way and stuff like that. So it was really difficult uh, to photograph at, at first, but the more time I spent, uh, I kind of got to, uh, got to know um, their behavior a little better. So the fledglings were flying back and forth between uh, two buildings and kind of learning how to fly and learning how to land. And um, at one point I thought about it and I was like, well, if I'm, if I'm shooting them in flight at this kind of lower perspective, Maybe it would make sense to come by around the time of of golden hour, but also a little bit later too. Um, once the you know once the sky is really uh, lit up and kind of the sun's pretty low, and so that way I could capture maybe a silhouette with with them flying. So that's that's what happened here was uh, one of the one of the fledglings was perched and then kind of made a made a jump uh, to to another part of the building, and I kind of captured that moment where. Um, it was hovering right over that break in the building. So I, I really like it uh, because of that um, that kind of moment that uh, is captured where it's jumping from one one piece of the building to another. And uh, the, the cloud really makes it for me, too. I, I, I can't imagine this image without without the cloud. Uh, so so that that amazing color that the cloud brings and the, the emphasis on the bird. And even though, you know, it might be hard to tell exactly what species, it's kind of that um, that really classic bird pose of of jumping with the wings out and the tail out and the legs out and everything everything looking um kind of perfect there so i yeah i I really liked the the pose of the bird too um that that really was important yeah it's it's a really nice and it it kind of like reminds me um of when i saw my first peregrine falcons i was going on ebird and basically i i saw that where my dad works there was um nesting peregrine falcons and i'm like dad just do you gotta go see that (laughs) so he just walks over from his building walks over to the other one and asks some random person do you know the peregrine falcons that are nesting here like oh yeah totally they just bring him over unlock the door and there's like you know how you were saying it was hard to get on the perspective he was where he was like right on the same level as the nest (laughs) box 
Um, and he like FaceTimes me and I see the Peregrine Falcons like right there on his phone. So the next day we went and I got some, you know, photos of the juvenile and they're doing the exact same thing you were saying, like jumping from a part of the building to another part of the building. Yeah. So it just kind of makes me think like pretty similar behaviors. Once you said Peregrine, I was like, oh, Alex got a story for this. <laughs> the, um, yeah, that's wait. awesome story. Yeah. Hey, Sadie, do you guys, when you were in Col uh, Colorado, did you get a lot of Peregrines out there? Or? Um, I haven't seen too, too many, but um, up in the foothills, you do get a lot of um, interesting rock formations, and a lot of them are, um, there were some cliffs. I think there was a nest or two a couple summers ago, but it's just so high up and hard to... Yeah you know, get close mm -hmm. enough to get a good shot. Oh, I, I, so I got another Peregrine Falcon story for you guys. So there's like a <laughs> day, a day in the, it's October 4th, actually. I even remember the date. I'm at this beach and it's a super like huge push of migration day. There's like tons of sparrows, kinglets. I literally saw hundreds of kinglets. Um, and like all these different birds hopping around. And then I hear that like, they all kind of go quiet. So I look up. And I'm like, oh, my God, look, there's a peregrine falcon in the tree. And my dad's like, no. I'm like, come over. And it's just like s s right up in the tree staring at us, like pretty close. We were like staring right under it and had to like back up to really see it. Nice. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and I, have a, I have a kind of a story um, to build off of the story I just told. I, I really had no expectation to uh, really see any eye level. And I was fine with that because I was, you know, shooting some silhouettes and getting some some nice shots that I were ha that I was happy with, but uh, one day um, w when I get to the location, I'm kind of looking at the box from a distance, like across a highway, uh, not not too close at it uh, to it at all, and um, kind of just watching from a distance. And then I look in front of me, and on a fence is one of the fledglings it's just right, right there. there. That's yeah, awesome. and so yeah, so I kind of um, I kind of got to see a, a closer look, though I, I I definitely kept my distance, but. Um, got some got some shots of uh, a fledgling. It was it was truly amazing to see one. Yeah, we get I don't know we get a good amount of them by me. I had one this um, earlier in like November. Uh, I was photographing a snowy owl on the beach, and then like I don't know like three hundred feet no not like three hundred feet like five hundred feet away from the snowy there was just a peregrine on a greater yellow legs I believe just sitting on the beach right there. I was like bro. So that oh, that's cool. so that's so bittersweet. Oh, yeah. I see. I love shorebirds, and like we only get them during migration. Mm -hmm. So like seeing a yellow legs for me is pretty, you know, pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it. Yeah. All right, here. I'm... Yeah. Oh, you can pull up the next one. Yeah, it was cool yeah. though to see him. He was just like, I got to lie down like eye level with it. I don't know if I ever posted it though. Oh, that's. No, nice. you should. Oh, All wow. right. So this one right here is just a snow bunting. And there's, I got a lot of photos to go along with this one. So just get right into it. Um, there's this farm and it's private property, but on one side, there's like this area where the guy who owns the farm spreads just manure. <laughs> and then next to it, there is a sunflower field and across there's just more farmland, but the guy who owns it is a birder. And well, not as much as a birder, but he just like saw that a lot of people were coming to see the snow buntings and stuff in the winter so he actually planted the sunflower field because he felt bad that they were eating manure <laughs> well that did not change what they were doing but um so birder and he's like he put up a sign and he's like you know what guys come through take as many photos as you want of all the birds do whatever you want so um you know the the snow buntings actually prefer to eat the manure on the ground they eat like little seeds they pick out of it but when it starts snowing a lot and we had some arctic air came through it pushed down snow buntings from Ontario, actually. So um, they came down and they did not want to, well, they couldn't eat the manure because it was covered in snow. So they went to the sunflower field and sunflower seeds that were pushed down, like, I don't know, just fell down on the ground. They were eating those, but they were also perching on top of the sunflowers. So I was like really desperate to get a shot because I've only gotten them on the ground. And I was like, just walking casually to them pretty slowly. And they're just flying back. So I'm like, okay, I know how to fix this. I started going on my knees and I'm just like slowly walking towards them and they still fly back. So then I go on my stomach and I'm like crawling like super slowly and they still keep flying back. I just <laughs> couldn't get close to them. But then just one of them was like right on the sunflower. So I was able to get close to it by crawling and took a few shots and then it flew off and I got this one. And it was actually one six fortieth of a second. So, uh, 
still got a good shot. Nice. I also, for, for people who are at home, this is a snow bunting on top of a sunflower, like in flight, coming at, right at the camera. All right, so this next photo of a snow bunting is actually on the same day. I, after getting that shot, I decided I wanted to go back to where they were feeding in the road because someone actually spilled some corn for them. And that's the only place I could get close. I like, they got scared by a car passing by. So then I went down on my stomach and um, they came really close, but not so close, but enough, you know, like I get yeah. some shots. And then um, the light actually started to peek out of the clouds. So it was really nice, soft lighting. And I went across the side of the road and lay down. And this one came within like 10 feet of me. It was just crazy, just like hopping super close. Do you guys, uh, do you guys, oh, sorry. I was just oh, no, go on. Yeah. Uh, do you guys get snow buntings by you at all or no? Yeah, I, I believe, um, I believe kind of a little further north than me, I believe, gets some, but uh, I, I, I've only, you know, been photographing smaller birds for, for a little bit now, so um, I, I don't believe I've ever seen one uh, before, but definitely uh, up there on my list of birds I'd like to see. Yeah. Colorado, yeah, well, by any chance, or? I've never seen one, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, call, oh, sorry. You can keep oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Go on. Oh, no, I'm just saying. I don't know. It seems like the mountainy, like, western states don't get a lot of, like, the, don't get a lot of those or, like, snowy owls or anything. I know Wyoming. I mean, Yellowstone seems like a great place for snow, uh, snowy owls, like, snow buntings and mm -hmm. stuff. You just don't see them out there, you know. I don't know, but uh, what were you saying, Alex? Oh, I just want to, people listening on a podcast, this is just a snow bunting in the snow. That's basically all you have to know. Um, but I think it really looks like a toasted marshmallow. Be honest. Yeah, I can That's see a that too. Pretty accurate description. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, what I've noticed, like, is that places with the mountains get a lot more finches, like that kind of high north bird, but they don't tend to get birds that are just high north. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. Like, you know, this was kind of an eruption year for snow buntings as well as <laughs> the winter finches, and at this location, there was like 250 snow buntings. It's crazy. That's awesome. Uh, and then here's a Lapland longspur. It's the same thing in the snow. Uh, it's the same thing happened where it kind of just got close to me after I waited in the snow a while. And its wing is right up because I, when I clicked the shutter button, there's a photo I took before this, it got scared. <laughs> and then, so I, when I clicked it, it got um, it scared and put its wing up like it was about to leave. But then there's the next frame. It noticed that it was okay and put its wing back down and I could get a portrait of it okay <laughs> in that sunflower field there was there, like during the beginning of the eruption year hundreds of these common red poles so i saw this photo and i'm like the bill looks a little short on that one for people aren't listening on a podcast this is just a hoary red pole on top of a sunflower but i saw that the bill was short and that there wasn't as much streaking on it. And the cap was a little bit smaller on the top of the finch. And I'm like, this has got to be a hoary. So I put it in eBird and it went through, I think, like two or three state reviewers. And they decided that, yeah, this is a hoary red pole, which here in Ohio is actually pretty rare. And you don't normally get them um, uh, in any given year. I remember you sent it in the chat and you sent it to me and stuff. And I was like the only person, me and Daniel were the only people saying it was a hoary red pole. Everyone else yeah. is saying common, and I was like, bro. Um, you guys, wait, so you guys have to get, well, I know you get red poles in uh, Minnesota, but I mean, you had to have gotten red poles in Colorado, right? Um, I'm actually not sure. I haven't um, really been photographing too many of the smaller birds and stuff. Yeah, I got you. Same. But right. I wouldn't be too yeah. surprised. I feel like I have seen pictures from the area and stuff, so. I yeah, mean, I... yes, yeah, we don't normally get that many red poles, but this was an eruption year, so we got a good yeah. amount of them. I got a lot of winter finches, actually. I was, um, I didn't get any shots of pine grosbeaks. I was walking home from school, and I saw a flock of birds up on these trees. And I was like, oh, those are cool. And I got closer. I'm like, wait, those are pine grosbeaks, which we don't get that often. But, yeah, so. Well, this next one's a common red pole. And this is the second to last one <laughs> for all the torture I'm giving you guys. Um, it's just a common red pole on top of a sunflower and the background and foreground is pretty blurry and it's eating the sunflower seed but yeah the foreground nice and background is nice there yeah i love that yeah. foreground for, awesome. foreground blur it really frames it really well yeah. yeah thank you all right this last one's a horn lark singing 
So I've had the same problem with the horn larks as the snow buntings were. I just couldn't get close to them. And then one individual I was able to get close to. And this guy was singing and just really like the shot. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we get some of those guys near me. Um, I was able to get someone. I was doing the snowies again this year. Same beach. You know, I was just lying down and I had some nice horned larks that were there. So that was fun. But yeah, I miss metal larks by 50 feet, I think. I was walking in front of my mom, and my mom calls me and goes, hey, uh, what were those yellow birds we were trying to get? And uh, I forget where we were trying to get them. And I was like, you mean meadow larks? And she's like, yeah, three of them just like landed in a tree right next to me. I was like, no. <laughs> so, uh, see, oh, yeah. um, there's like this one park where we have a lot of nesting field birds, like bobo lynx, henslow sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, and then the eastern meadow larks. And I could just never get close to them. Like I had one fly and I was able to get photos of it like that, but mm -hmm. she could never yeah. get close. Yeah, they're difficult, but you know, you get what you get. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to share. This is Martin's shot. It is a snowy owl in flight and the whole background is black. Yeah. So I got this early November. Now I haven't done a lot of shooting of snowy owls recently. Um, and by recently, I mean like probably... January through February, mainly because there's a lot of people getting outside because COVID. So, I mean, there's a lot of pressure being put on the birds. But in early November, I mean, the snowy action near me was crazy. This particular shot was taken. I was, it's a natural black background for the most part. I was shooting, I, I was scrolling through my shots when one of them flew pretty close by me. And then I got in a, a, like a fight with another one. And while I was scrolling through my pictures, I accidentally jacked my sh uh, shutter speed up to 8,000th of a second. And that was unfortunate. So, <laughs> yeah. So it made everything dark, but I was able to take that because it was um behind it was a really dark dune with like a bunch of dark like trees and branches and stuff. And what I was able to do was I was able to take the dark since it was already um dark exposure anyways, and the bird was white. I was able to just make it a black background from there. So that paid off eventually. But yeah, I mean, I remember I looked through the shots and there was after I took this picture, like this was like a few frames after. This is like a female, I think. And a juvenile male came and they went talon to talon, like just like their wings were spread out and the shot wasn't in focus. So yeah, if I had- That's, that's unfortunate. Worse. That's unfortunate. I if I had got that with this black background, it probably would have been like my favorite owl shot ever. But yeah, yeah that that's unfortunate. And it seems like sometimes those just have to be, you know, the, the one that got away. Yeah, I'm happy with what I got though. I'm really happy with that. Oh yeah, and background. and that that shot turned out great, and I I really like the um kind of that position of the snowy owl just coming in. Um, yeah, snowies yeah. are, uh, you know, we had a discussion before the snow uh, the show. Uh, snowies are are awesome, and from the experiences I've had, um, they really are are really amazing, and I I, I don't think I have any nice flight shots like that. So congrats on that. Thank you. All right, so this next shot is an eastern screech owl inside a cavity, and behind it, you can actually see a car in the background. Mm -hmm. So um, most of the owl pictures that you'll see, like on my Instagram and the things I've posted, are actually from super suburban areas. So here in this one, you see like a minivan and then a house and like a window in the background and stuff. Um, and it just kind of surprises me how few people in that area have seen these owls here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, I guess in a lot of other areas and stuff, like around here, um, I haven't had too much luck finding owls in any of the neighborhoods and stuff. You have to go into the mountains, into the woods a little bit more. Um, and there, there were actually so many opportunities. Like, I, um, I don't think I rode my bike to get this picture, um, on this day because of how snowy it was, um. But it's, I guess, just a reminder um, that you should still be constantly, like, looking around your neighborhood and stuff. And even just in your own backyard, you can find some pretty amazing wildlife still. Yeah. Yeah, during migration, I think I've gotten, like, 10 species of warbler in my backyard. Mm -hmm. But, like, do you know, is, is what's the habitat like and what is it really eating? So um, there's a lot of squirrels, which I think might be a little too big for the screech owls, for a actually. Screech, maybe a tad. Yeah. Maybe a tad. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of mice. I don't think there's too many rats. I haven't. I don't and think I've ever seen sorry. one. But Yeah, I think yeah. a rat would actually be too big for a screech. I mean, could rats are pretty yeah. big. 
<laughs> in urban areas, the thing is, there's a lot of owls. Well, I get a lot of my screeches in urban uh, in urban areas. Actually, probably my favorite screech story is I was in a Dunkin' Donuts drive through and we're coming through, and I'm on my phone, right? I'm on my phone, and I see a red thing in a pine tree, all concealed, just a little red dot. And I thought it was bark, and I'm like, because I'm always looking around. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I need, I need to probably check that when I get up there. So I completely forget about it. We get up to the window, we're getting our stuff, and I'm like, oh, I need to check the thing. And I'm expecting just like a, a leaf. That's the main thing, like, you know, <laughs> a dry leaf. Mm-hmm. So I look, and there's a screech right outside the window. Wait, did you have your camera? Yeah, yeah. We were, we, we were just taking a pit stop from doing like trying to find snowies. And I go, oh, that's an owl. And I just threw open the door and just kneeled down <laughs> in the middle of a, a drive through um, So that was pretty cool. I, I get a lot of um, screeches. I mean, by me, a lot of them are in people's yards. You have to shoot them from the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, a lot of the people are pretty nice, you know, like Alex was saying. I mean, you don't let you on your pro- on their property, but you just shoot from the road and it's all fine. I remember I was shooting long ears up in upstate New York, though. And these people, like, you had to stay on the road. And if you accidentally put, like, your foot over one of their blade of grass on accident from like shooting from the road they'd probably like shoot you they were not a fan <laughs> of people in general <laughs> but yeah i mean and speaking of sorry i don't mean to keep talking but speaking of like urban areas too what i've noticed is in new york city for example i got a barn owl in new york city actually in 2018 um because it's so full of mice and pigeons and everything there's just so many good opportunities for raptors so there's a lot of peregrine falcons a lot of red tails a lot of you know any place where there's an urban like a, a little park in an urban area there's probably just bound to be a bard or a great horn there at least you know mm-hmm. so like what was the habitat it's just like literally a house or is it like more shrubby like you can see in the yeah. photo yeah so um in colorado um out of the mountains anyways it's just a lot of grass a lot of open space a lot of fields and stuff um and trees will only really grow along the creeks where there's water for most of the year. Um, so that helps narrow down like specific locations to go and search for them anyways. Um, yeah. But up around the creeks, you know, there are a lot of shrubs. There's a lot of um, sticks everywhere in this picture, which does make it a little challenging at times. Um, mm-hmm. I think this one, too, was along. There's like just a little um, neighborhood trail, too. So there were... You know, there was a path and there were spaces that were cleared out and stuff. Yeah, um, gotcha. And most of the time the owls are um, not so much like in the center of a neighborhood, but they'll usually usually be near um, an area where there is an open field. And I'm assuming they'll go sit like on the edge of the trees there and then just watch for stuff around us. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's a really nice shot. Yeah. And it's a cool cavity, too. I like the cavity. <laughs> the yeah. cavity is nice. I've mm-hmm. got some by me we're going to go out for tomorrow, hopefully. It's like a cut-off tree with a, a cut-off limb with a hole, and there's a gray and a red that's been sitting up there. So I'm hoping. Uh, yeah. Hoping. That'll be cool if we get them. But the, um, yeah, are we, are we doing Noah's up next? Yeah. So oh. this next one is a lot of white branches going around, and it's, what what kind of animal is that? It's a coyote. Okay, it's a coyote. I couldn't tell because it's black and white, so take it away. Yeah, so this one. Um, I, I had heard and even seen at night a, a coyote in this location. And so, uh, with permission, I, I set up some trail cameras and, um, the results were I actually got a video of two of them, uh, walking in the snow. So that was, that was really awesome. And so I, I was really, um, kind of committed to trying to see if I could maybe make something work with, uh, with a photograph and a little more context. I, I really hadn't had too much luck with with coyotes pre- prior to this. Uh, yeah. uh, in Arizona, I was I was photographing a, a sunrise and um, saw one go by and quickly changed my settings and got it in the frame and uh, just got one photo in focus and wasn't that great. Uh, definitely uh, thought I could do better. Um, but uh, kind of fast forward to this winter and um, it had snowed the night before, so. Uh, woke up to kind of a winter wonderland and um, and and went went to this location and uh, and saw kind of what looked looked to be a couple dogs, uh, two dogs, and then um, then I kind of got my camera ready and focused and then it turned out no they were not dogs they were they were coyotes <laughs> yeah. and I watched uh, I watched one uh, kill a squirrel um, oh. which was yeah which was pretty um, pretty crazy to watch and then uh, that one walked out of the kind of out of my my view my vantage point and then um a second coyote came so this one so 
um, it, it walked down the path. Um, and I think I saw it prior to it, but I was like, okay, wow, that there's two different coyotes here. And um, really for this one, I was shooting kind of a, on a deck. So above, above the path in kind of a Creek area. So it was, it was kind of not necessarily, you know, a lot of when I was learning photography uh, from YouTube or Instagram, whatever um, you hear a lot, like get eye level. I wasn't necessarily eye level, um, but I, I feel like it, it definitely works out because it kind of shows that path and kind of shows more of the, the habitat and the, the winter wonderland that I kind of mentioned. So uh, definitely one of those scenarios where I personally think um, it worked better to have kind of a higher perspective than to be, be eye level. I think that sets it apart a bit. And um, yeah, and I, I really liked the, the way it turned out when I edited it this way um, to kind of show that, uh, that scene, the way, the way it looked, the light wasn't, wasn't too great, but I was able to do some editing and um, I think it, it turned out all right. Yeah. I this mean, shot is insane. Yeah. You <laughs> this know, this is crazy. I, I'm kind of like really strict with like get eye level, you know, put your camera. I always say if the subject's on the ground, so is your camera. But I think that if you like let your eye wander on this, even though it automatically goes to the coyote, it's like really pleasing to the eye. And I think that the fact that you were an eye level actually helps the image, which I don't normally say. Yeah, this Thank is you. insane. The foreground is super awesome and it's just all white. I mean, that's awesome. We um we get coyotes by me. Um, I had one that was really chill this year, but there's so many people out and about, not even wildlife photographers. Like at my wildlife photography spot, there's usually like 30 people there a day this year. I mean, it's, it's been like 200 people or like 300 people, just like beach goers and stuff walking. It's like minus 10 degrees. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, <laughs> you know? Um, but we get some coyotes there sometime. So I was able to get a few this year there. Uh, no crazy good shots, but in uh, Yellowstone in 2019, I was able to get some really nice yotes out there. No wolves though, but. Yeah. And, and I think it's kind of funny, both of my coyote photos that I've taken or, you know, two of my only all right ones, I'd, I'd say are kind of the coyote walking away. So I'm, I'm yet to get kind of a head on, um, you know, frame filling uh, portrait, but I, I definitely am happy with what I've, what I've gotten and um, might, might see coyotes in the future at this location, but it, it's one of those things that I wasn't really uh, planning on um, seeing one that morning and kind of, kind of was shocked, but I uh, had to, had to make something work fast. And none of the squirrel images turned out um, just because it was kind of hard to, to understand what was going on in the photo because of how far away it was. But yeah. um, this, this one kind of was the only good frame from the day, but uh, one of my favorites that I've taken. It's awesome. Yeah, the um the problem is a lot of time when you're like taking pictures like predation a lot of time you don't know what's happening until it already did. And then it's like I was shooting um in Alaska, had a grizzly mom take down a baby moose right in front of me and I couldn't get the shots cuz she was in like 4 foot tall grass. I just see her tackle the moose and bring it up all over the river bank. But that was nuts. But yeah, same problem. I mean, I couldn't get any shots through all the grass and whatnot. But yeah, that shot's insane, dude. That's a that's Thank crazy. You. Yeah, I got I got two things to say, then we're gonna have to wrap it up here. First thing is, is that in my backyard, I had, and I always like to say this whenever I hear the word coyote, I had a melanistic coyote, which means instead, it's like the opposite of albino, it has like extra, um, it's like dark, basically a dark kind of black coyote, just like kind of in my backyard in the morning. <laughs> and then also, let's settle this debate. Is it coyote or coyote? Okay, I say coyote, <laughs> coyote, and yoke. So I'm kind of on all sides here, I guess. I don't know. I mean, but I say all three of those. I don't know. It's fun. Yote is all fun, right. though. Coyote is for me. So I'm on the yours? coyote side, too. Yeah. <laughs> I say you coyote. Now? Coyote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, coyote is fun. And I, well, I get coyote. I have uh, family from middle of, like, Midwest, like, Iowa, you know, middle of nowhere. <laughs> so they say coyote all the time. So that's where I got coyote from. And then the people out here say coyote. So it's kind of like a mix of those two. And then I don't know where I got yoke from. I just started to say. <laughs> Probably made it up. So, Probably. Or, or you can say it like Spanish, coyote. Coyote. <laughs> Probably best that's way to say it. All right, guys. That about sums it up here today at YWPPC Podcasts and Photo Chat with your host, me, Alex, and Martin. Cue the music. <laughs>